Good afternoon. Trust you enjoyed uh, good morning sessions uh, earlier today and a lovely lunch. Um, my name's Tristram Keach and I'm uh, create, uh, design director of a company called Keach Design uh, based down in London, but I'm also a uh, part-time uh, third year lecturer, senior lecturer for the product design course, uh, master of design course at Coventry University. And um, why am I here? Well, I'm here to chair this session, this keynote speech uh, by John Mathers, who's going to be talking to us about the future role of designers, you may have guessed. Um, and this is an interesting question for me because as a designer, as someone who said to Mr. Simpson when I was six years old in my class, when, when he said, what do you want to be when you're older? I said designer. Now, I didn't know what a designer was. My dad was a graphic designer, and I thought it was just someone who kind of messed around with pots of ink and paper and card and printing and all sorts of stuff like that. So for me, it was a very attractive thing, but it was very much a, uh, a visual thing. It was very much about creating, making, uh, testing, make, busting things and looking what was inside them. And um, I came to Coventry to study initially car design. I thought I wanted to be a car designer. But I very rapidly realized that there was a lot more to design than just styling and uh, making things look great and making things desirable and have people say to you, wow, isn't that wonderful, isn't that beautiful? There's a lot more to it, a lot more cerebral process was going on for me. And it's actually why I became a product designer rather than a car designer, but that's another discussion. Anyway, um, I left and became a freelance designer in Paris for a year where I met my lovely wife. and came back to London and became part of the Conran Empire. Now, Terence Conran, as you may know, is, I would say, we could fairly say the godfather of British design. But Conran, um, I was there for 10 years and rose to the lofty heights of design director. And uh, the Conran way of doing design was very much, we might say, and it's still got some valid validity in the 21st century, but um, very much about... Um, lifestyle and aesthetics and our point of view, the Conran pair of eyes on things. And that's, that's great and that's lovely and I enjoyed my time there very, very much. I worked with architects and interior designers and it was very interdisciplinary and I really appreciated that uh, schooling that I had. But there was something else going on. There was this design thinking vibe going on and it had been running for quite a few years by that time and I thought, I'm really missing out on this. Anyway, I got invited by uh, the creative director of an innovation consultancy called PDD uh, to go and work with him and help form a visual front-end industrial design team. So that was all about, yes, it was all about the aesthetics of products and trying to create desirable products, but it was also about doing it in a human-centered way in a technology context. So it was very much about a holistic view on design. It was very much about interdisciplinary design, and it's very much about um, collaboration, co-creation with end users or user audiences, as you might call them, uh, but also with other stakeholders in the situation. So there's people that produce these products, there's people that market them, there's people that have a, a different point of view on them. And so when I finished two and a half years at PDD, I kind of felt sort of big-headed enough to go and try and do it for myself. Didn't quite do it with myself, I'm doing it with my very good friend of 10 years, David Keach, and now we run um, a company called Keach Design. He has the same surname, that's pure chance. But um, so this subject of the future old design is very interesting because, as I understand it, uh, John's going to be talking about the interdisciplinary nature of the role of a designer today. And that's very much what David and I do down in London. We do ID, and ID for us stands for, yes, industrial design, but it also stands for interface design, it stands for interior design, but it also stands for things like innovate and discuss or... Uh, intelligence as in search out design intelligence intelligence and develop but it might also mean inspire and delight and i hope uh, i hope that's what we do with our products anyway enough about me we're here to listen to john mather mathers so um without further ado i'll hand you over afternoon everyone how are you right let's see um, what I want to do today is uh, try and talk for as little as I can and um, hopefully have more time to um, have some discussion and some questions and things. So let's see how we get on. Um, what I wanted to do today was uh, talk a little bit about uh, 
the Design Council and where um, I come from, talk a little bit about uh, our world today and the challenges and opportunities and how that's really sort of changing, and then move into talking a little bit about some emergent thinking about the role of design and how design can play a part in, particularly how design can play a part and designers can play a part in um, our modern business society, creating new opportunities, uh, entrepreneurism, uh, invention. So um, let me, first of all, just tell you a little bit about, um, about uh, the Design Council. Um, I mean, the Design Council's changed um, an awful lot uh, in the last few years, um, but we've been going for 70. So this is our, the year of our 70th birthday. We um, were set up by Winston Churchill back in 1944, at the end of the Second World War. And we were set up then as the Council for Industrial Design. So very much at that stage, about um, promoting great design in industrial products. Britain has always been known for um, its manufacturing capability, maybe less so in recent years, um, but design is very much, has always been very much the bedrock of that. Design changed tremendously and has been changing ever since, uh, which is why back in the 70s uh, we became the Design Council. And um, why back in 2011 when we uh, no longer were a government body, but became a charity and merged with an, an organisation called CABE. And CABE stands... Does anyone know what CABE stands for? Excellent, yeah. So Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment, uh, which, grew it, which itself grew out of the Royal Fine Art Commission. And CABE's mission in life is to promote, to promote the very best of architecture and the built environment for people. So it actually ties in very neatly with um, what the Design Council has always been doing, um, where we've got people and great design for people at our very heart. And I think the joining of the two organisations means that we have an organisation, I think, that is quite unique in the world. I don't think there's another organisation at a national level <coughs> that has that breadth of remit, product, service, um, policy, um, the public sector, um, neighbourhoods, communities, homes, buildings. Um, so it gives us, um, well, it gives us a big challenge because we've got a lot to, lot to do, but it gives us a wonderful and unique opportunity to look holistically at the impact that design can have. Um, one, uh, one thing I'm very conscious of is that uh, there are some people, when I joined the Design Council uh, two and a bit years ago, that um, we'd become very sort of London-centric and I'm very... And determined that that should change. We're a national organisation, and the reality is that we're now um, uh, working right across um, England and Scotland. Um, uh, the, some of the team were in Ireland last week. I'm not sure we're doing very much in Wales, but we'll sort that one out in due course. And actually, we're working um, just down the road um, from here, working with uh, Warwick University, helping them support um, the uh, fantastic development and growth that is going on there. We're also, uh, I ironically, talking to um, Coventry City Council, but they're being a bit slow at the moment, so we'll just, um, if anyone knows anyone in there, give them a prod and um, say how important design is. So um, our very simple mission is uh, to champion great design that uh, improves people's lives. And um, we're now um, a charity, so uh, we need to become an enterprising charity, so we need to generate income from the services that we provide. And that means taking the benefits of design as an approach or a process um, to a wider set uh, of problems in business and society. And um, what I'll do is tell you a little bit about some of the things that we've been doing in the last few years. And it's often, um, more than anything else, taking design and design thinking um, to people who haven't been exposed to that idea as uh, something as a problem solver. And, of course, the definition of design has changed fundamentally over the years. I think, as, as you quite rightly said, back in the day, Design was about the um, simple um, way that you made something look good, that you added value at the end of a process. I think those of us um, in the know, and I'm hoping that the people in this room are of the same ilk as I, um, that design is actually something, and design thinking is something that can create value if it's introduced at the beginning of a, a way of thinking. So what we try and do um, at the Design Council is essentially three things. Um, 
demonstrate. So what does the great design look like, um, particularly in terms of the way that we look at new products, services, systems, and the environment? Um, we enable others to perform and transform using design uh, through coaching, training, supporting, and embedding new skills. And it's also about new leading edge design thinking. So we've always been known as a brand and we're known as a brand throughout the world for the thought leadership, the campaigning, the policy making that, um, that really moves things forward. And um, I urge you if you um, get a chance to, to have a look at our web platform and website and, and just see some of the things that we've been talking about recently. So let me quickly just tell you about um, design for growth because for me, um, at the end of the day, uh, this is still probably one of the most important areas. Um, uh, it's historically been the focus for us at the Design Council, and just to give you an example, you know, in the time between, say, 2000 and, oh, I don't know, 2006 and 2013, we worked with around 2,000 businesses right across the UK, helping them to reach new markets, develop new products and services. And uh, over a thousand of them have been coached quite intensely uh, and really helped them transform their businesses. And I think um, you know the role of um, the role of in, of design in, in in competitiveness in the UK is increasingly being recognised by government. And I think that's a really important um, thing to acknowledge because um, for the first time, not only design but the creative industries are being recognised by uh, government. There was uh, some work done, uh, and as always, isn't it, it's the case that if you don't measure something, you don't value it. Well, we measured the creative industries at the beginning of this year, and um, would you believe the creative industries in the UK is just about as large as the financial services industry, and more importantly, it's growing faster than any other um, sector in the UK. So we've always sort of known, haven't we, that we're a creative nation, but what we haven't always known is just how important that creativity and that industry is to our economy. Well, we do now. Um, and I think the important thing for me is that uh, that's recognised, it's being acknowledged. There's a, a new thing called the Creative Industries Council being set up. There's a Creative Industries strategy in place. I'm fortunate enough to be involved in that. And the um, key thing within that is that whilst all the different sectors of the creative industries are doing extremely well, so film, um, I'm trying to remember, I'll never remember them all, but it's film, architecture, uh, fashion, uh, uh, gaming, uh, importantly, we're... Britain leads the way in gaming um, and design. Design is actually the fastest growing sector um, overall. I'm also going to talk a little bit later about the importance of uh, design in uh, Europe. Uh, now I don't know what your opinion about the European Union is, and we don't need to get into that today, but um, design in Europe and being recognised across Europe is, um, uh, is really important. And we are leading a programme called Design for Europe. Again, I, I urge you to have a look at the website and um, sign up to it. And with that programme, which is a £4 million programme over the next three years, we're working with, I think it's 13 partners across Europe to really um, identify the best examples of where design has been used to showcase innovation in business, in the public sector, and increasingly interestingly, in policy making. I mean, who would have thought that at one point, that someday the, the government um, would have a, a, a policy making, a design, open design unit, policy making unit at the centre of the Cabinet Office, which they do at the moment. It's headed up by a lady called Andrea Seardmock, who um, used to work at the Design Council. Um, so, um, back to business growth. Over 2,000 businesses in the last five or so years. We work with um, uh, the whole breadth. We work with SMEs, small, medium-sized businesses, but we also work with um, multinationals. We're working with Rolls-Royce Aerospace at the moment, for instance, um, helping them use design within their supply chain. People like Rolls-Royce have realised just how important their supply chain is to help them innovate. Um, Rolls-Royce, big lumbering beast, um, the agility and the entrepreneurship is actually in the people who are supplying um, their products and services. And we're helping them work with their supply chain to turn them into real partners in innovation. Um, and working from you know, individual entrepreneurs to global supply chains. So training, support, mentoring, um, 
uh, coaching. And, um, you know, the, uh, the critical thing that we've always done and always will continue to do is measure the impact of what we do. If you don't measure it, it doesn't get valued. Um, and so recently we've been doing some work where we know that for every one pound spent on design, businesses can expect to um, have some quite um, incredible um, turnarounds in terms of profit, in terms of exports, really important in the UK at the moment, um, and also in terms of jobs. I haven't got the jobs stat on there, but um, for every one pound spent on design, we reckon that you can get three or four new jobs created. Uh, yeah, I need to walk that one through, but it's not quite that easy. <laughs> so uh, let me just quickly, if you've got a moment, I'll just um, play this little video, which I think um, says it much more eloquently than I. Being a small business in Britain isn't easy, is it? In fact, right now, it all looks pretty bleak. And yet, within the next five years, the government believes over half of all new jobs will come from small businesses. That's you. Despite all this doom and gloom, some companies have already found a way to grow. So what's their secret? You see, design isn't just about shiny gadgets or a new logo. It's about thinking beyond what you normally do and transforming the world around you. Think of design as a really flexible and powerful tool that can help with everything your business needs to thrive like making new products that reach new customers, improving your workplace so you're more productive, while creating an exciting brand that you can watch grow. And the results? Well, they speak for themselves. Every one pound spent on design can give you over 20 pounds in increased revenue and four pounds in increased profit. And if you want to sell to new markets, that same one pound can turn into five pounds in increased exports. It's no surprise that UK businesses spend 33 billion on design every year. So what makes design such a powerful tool? It's simple, really. Design is about people. Designers solve problems by working out the impact that your product or service will have on the people that use it. Whatever you're designing, people, your customers, your team, are at the heart of it. That means your design can't help but be user-friendly so people can't help but like what you do. That's good news for your business, which is pretty good news for everyone. Design is about thinking differently and growing your business. See? It's really not a secret. Um, I'm sorry about that being a Scottish voiceover. I, we're not all Scottish at the uh, Design Council, I can assure you. Um, uh, uh, another interesting thing that we're doing, and I'll just quickly mention this, you, um, uh, have a have a look at it uh, yourself if you're interested. Uh, we do a lot of work with Warwick Business School. We've got a very interesting embryonic uh, unit called the Behavioural Design Unit, which is marrying our design thinking with um, Warwick Business School's behavioural science team. And I think bringing that behavioural uh, aspect to everything that we do, which very much picks up on the, the end bit of the film where we're talking about human-centred approach. Really interesting. Um, and we did a piece of work leading business by design last year. Oh, no, no, no. Um, just to give you some you know, very grounded um, examples, this is, um, uh, Nailers is a very interesting one, a Yorkshire, uh, Yorkshire business, fourth generation. Um, they were a clay pipe, um, clay drainage pipe manufacturer, um, and they've been doing it since 1890. Well, surprise, surprise, you know, back in, the, the, um, back in five, five or six years ago, uh, that was becoming an increasingly challenging market, plastic piping coming into the market, and, and their business was in real trouble. They were um, having to think about losing some of their staff, and it was something that very proudly they had never done in their lives. So uh, we worked with them. Um, we worked with um, our design associates. The model we have is that we're a relatively small team, but we work with design associates who are spread throughout the country, and we have about 300 design and built environment associates. We worked with Nailers, we looked at their assets and we looked at what they could do with their um, product um, development, they looked at what they could do with their manufacturing, and we relaunched uh, a, a small range that they had called Yorkshire Flower Pots. It was a branded range of terracotta flower pots um, which were competing pretty uh, badly against imports from China and Korea. 
and uh, you know it had everything that you needed in terracotta real ruggedness of um, durability and strength and last last durability you know they lasted uh, way much longer than any of the foreign imports um, high quality back to their heritage back to their materials that they were so um, good at working with and the result well the result is that the business is growing strongly they didn't get rid of any people over half of the company's sale now, sales now come from products that the company wasn't even making five years ago. The process of product development is much more structured within the organisation than, than ever it was before. And, you know, again, successful in that um, not only have they not got rid of people, but they're actually recruiting uh, new people um, quite strongly. Other end of the spectrum, at the technology end, um, this is a project called Heartlight, where we worked with the University of Nottingham. A wonderful um, little project. And, and, and this is a, a classic example of, of where I think startups really struggle. Um, a great idea. This was a, I mean, it literally was that size, a little heartbeat monitor that um, you could put on um, uh, prematurely born babies. And you, prematurely born babies is actually a much bigger issue than perhaps a lot of us realize. And it's so difficult to try and measure a baby's heartbeat. Um, and doctors actually have to use, if they're using a stethoscope, they would have to um, uh, stop what they were doing, measure the heartbeat, then get back to what they're doing. This little thing which attached to a baby's head um, made all the difference. Needed a lot of development though, so we worked with the University of Nottingham to identify a whole raft of other areas where this um, technology could be used, um, which meant that they got the VC, the venture capital input that they needed much earlier than if they'd just been developing the one simple thing. So uh, what we find often is that um, you work with inventors, people who create things, very narrow focus, um, and often it's that design thinking that um, broadens the mind and gets people to think um, slightly more laterally and slightly more strategically. Um, a similar story actually with, um, with Owlstone, which um, actually developed a, 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 a simple thing again, which actually they were going to use in the military um, in tanks to detect when gas was being released. Again, hugely difficult to get to market. But suddenly, if you think about new applications of that technology, um, you could do all sorts of amazing things. So uh, the biggest commercial success that they've had to date is um, in the basements of pubs where um, you've got a CO2 um, uh, leakage indicator, and that's selling like hotcakes. And that's allowed them then to develop the original idea that they had into something even more um, successful than it previously would have been. Let me just quickly give you some examples of um, uh, how we've used design compellingly in the, the public sector. And I don't know if, um, I don't know if any of you have been watching that uh, accident and emergency programme at uh, Royal St George's. Um, anyway, if you do, you'll see our signage in the background. Um, but the NHS came to us and said, what can you do to help um, us uh, reduce violent behaviour and aggression in accident and emergency? Because um, everything that we're doing isn't working and, uh, I mean, as you can probably imagine, staff morale in accident and emergency is, is, is critical. So we worked with a, a, a company called Pearson Lloyd, you'll, you'll know Pearson Lloyd well, um, who actually uh, did all of the um, interview work, um, they spent time in, in half a dozen accident emergencies, they noticed what the problems were, um, and then they've developed a very simple an effective signage system. The biggest challenge um, and the biggest sense of frustration in accident emergency is people, I mean, often in quite dire circumstances and, you know, in trauma, not knowing what happens next, not knowing how long they're going to have to wait, not knowing what the process is, not knowing why somebody uh, seems to get ahead of them. Um, and it really is a very simple process of signaling um, where they are in the queue, what the process is, how long things might take, how many patients are waiting. Um, now, of course, you're not ever going to get rid of the drunks and the, um, the people who come in um, wanting to make trouble. But we, again, the testing has shown that um, uh, the work we've done, the work Pearson Lloyd did with us, has had a huge impact um, on, you know, Patients um, feeling that they understood the process much better and therefore more willing to accept the process. 
most importantly, a huge drop in um, uh, the staff lack, the poor staff morale. Staff feel much clearer about what they can, about how the process is working, and uh, it, you know, really working. And I, it was quite interesting on the train on the way up here this morning. I saw. Um, an email that the cabinet office has somehow got sight of this and um, are now talking about rolling it out across um, across the whole of the NHS. And and to me, um, this you know, every week we're reading about the crisis in the NHS and um, you know, pouring money at things and throwing money at things. Design actually is one of these things that can actually say, look, we don't need to spend um, huge amounts of money. What we need to do is understand what the problem is and then from a human aspect, understand how we can actually deliver solutions that can help make things better. Um, uh, another interesting one that we're involved in at the moment is <clears throat> we're working in Southwark and Lambeth. And the, I mean, Southwark and Lambeth, as you probably can imagine, is quite a mixed race um, uh, area and so it has inherent challenges um, of its own but the biggest challenge of young children is that by the time kids in Southwark and Lambeth reach the age of five only 50% of them are fit for school um, they, often they're not physically fit they haven't been out and played enough they haven't interacted with other kids they're not socially fit um, they, 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 don't have, they don't interact with others they don't have language skills interpersonal skills I mean, it's the most appalling situation. And to be perfectly frank, social services just don't have a clue what to do about it. So um, about a year ago, we set up this thing called the Knee High Design Challenge, where we put out a call for um, loads of ideas. And the ideas came in from mums, from toddlers groups, from um, design companies, from the council employees themselves. And what we've done is funded the development of Initially 30 ideas, down to 10, down to 6, and we're now down to the final three. And the final three now have got £100,000 each. This is funded by um, Guys and St Thomas's Trust, who are based in La Southwark and Lambeth themselves. And those three um, organisations, those three ideas, are now being taken to the next stage. And if you're interested, again, all on our website. Um, and the idea will be that the, we take these to scale in Southwark and Lambeth and then take them to scale nationally um, at some point after that. And I'm really, um, I'm really um, uh, pleased about it. It's, they're fantastic ideas, and I think they will make a real difference. And last but not least, um, we do a huge amount of work in cities, and I, I sort of talked about um, working with Coventry. Active by Design is a really interesting programme that um, I probably don't have time to, to rattle on about today. Um, I'd love to, but maybe uh, another time. So, the role of design. Um, well, I talked a little bit about um, uh, the European policy context. I mean, it's taken a long time to get the European Parliament to really understand what design is about. The European Design Leadership Board, which was made up of um, a number of countries, really um, pushing and um, uh, cajoling the, the European government to introduce and in, in, include design in its um, enterprise and division to the extent that we've now got the uh, Design for Europe innovation platform. And that's uh, up and running, the website's live, um, and we're starting to populate it with uh, examples from all around Europe. So I urge you to have a look at that. I mean, why is design important? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here. I hope I am. Um, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, plays a salient role in moulding and shaping digital technology, making it useful and meaningful to people. Um, that's what uh, I think design really uh, does. I mean, could you imagine a world where technology and innovation exists without design? Uh, I think uh, there was an interesting Ofcom report just recently which states that the average six-year-old child understands more about dig digital technology than the average 45-year-old adult. Um, they may not necessarily know who Steve Jobs was or even how to tie their own shoelaces, but they're certainly uh, capable of operating an iPad. So um, in, in this world, I think design is playing uh, increasingly a pivotal role in bridging the, the digital divide. Does anybody know um, what won the uh, Design Museum Design Prize last year? 
Would anyone be surprised if I told them it was the government who won the um, design prize last year? Yeah? Well, the government won it with a thing called the Government Digital Service, YouGov. Um, uh, there's a guy called Mike Bracken who has got a, a floor of designers who is completely transforming the government's digital interface with its citizens. Um, and the Government Digital Service uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, is really leading the way. Um, and, and fascinatingly, um, there are countries like Estonia and Moldova where design thinking and service design is at the very heart of everything that the government does. So we are seeing a completely changing world. And, um, you know, the quality of designers, um, honesty, sensitivity, ability to empathize, really, really important, and simplify complex issues and data are the sort of key ingredients that I think are going to be the things that really allow our digital world to connect with the physical one in the future. For me, design makes it simple, design makes it usable, um, useful and delightful, exactly to the point you were making, and it makes it meaningful as well. So what are some of the challenges in our world today and how can design start to um, think about um, addressing some of these? I mean, we've got huge challenges in the world today, don't we? Um, our healthcare challenge, I mean, the, what is um, talked about as the growing tsunami of our older age population. By 2020, over 50% of our population in the UK will be over 65. I mean, that's a paradigm that um, we just, we've never experienced before, and um, we don't know how to deal with. Um, we got a huge challenge in terms of our housing and how we get affordable housing for um, people to be able to work. Um, our environment and some of the challenges that we face around that and sustainable economic development. Huge challenges. So how can design um, play a meaningful role um, in all of those? What are the boundaries of design? Well, um, I think, um, you know, for me, I, I sort of alluded it to earlier on, uh, design has moved and is continuing to move from simply being seen as something which uh, is applied as aesthetics. It's something that it's no longer something that adds value at the end. It's no longer something that makes something look nice. Um, it really has moved to being something which is very much about form and function and actually now about being the thing that can actually help to uh, solve problems. Um, the scope of design has stretched. It's become more strategic. I mean, um, I don't know if any of you have seen a thing called the Danish Design Ladder, which very eloquently talks about how design is moving up the scale in terms of um, operating at very senior levels in, in, in organizations. And I think, um, and the point that you were making actually, that design has become, and designers have become much more cross-disciplinary. Um, I mean, just to give you an example, for instance, I mean, at the Design Council, when we pull together a challenge like the knee-high challenge, for instance, um, we get a wide, wide range of people involved in our work. So, um, uh, you know, bringing together those sorts of disciplines and those sorts of approaches actually means that we have moved from being a single discipline approach to a cross-discipline to interdisciplinary. And as the world becomes more interconnected and complex, so have the problems as well as the opportunities. So we need to think about being multidisciplinary in the way that we work. So if, um, if design is being seen as an increasingly diverse and designers are being required to take on much more multifaceted and more strategic roles, um, it's great that we're starting to see designers in the boardroom. I mean, it's great that one of our um, biggest fashion brands in the UK is run by a designer. It's great that we have designers in v venture capital companies. Um, it's great that we have designers in government. Um, uh, Mike Bracken of the Government Digital Service uh, is currently recruiting designers to sit at the very heart of every government department. It's great that we have designers um, in uh, policy making. Perhaps the meaning of designers is also changing though and perhaps we need to be aware of the challenges that we face um, both in our education system and in our schools. So I think 
um, if you don't, you have a, a, a wide range of people are learning about design-led innovation practice or design thinking, uh, and we're teaching, you know, frontline public service servants, policymakers, etc. Um, we need to be thinking about how we um, change the way that we um, bring our um, next generation of designers to the fore, and what are the tools and processes and methodologies that we arm them with to be able to compete um, really effectively. We were talking earlier on about uh, uh, a fantastic uh, piece of work that's been done in Brighton um, in the last uh, couple of years, where um, what you get in Brighton is this amazing mix of um, design companies, creative companies, IT experts, digital experts, all mixing and matching and fusing together. And this piece of work demonstrated that when you get that sort of um, collaboration and interdisciplinary process working extremely well together, you get um, companies and products and services that are growing three times faster than products and services that you're getting uh, elsewhere in the country. So it, it's starting to be proven. People are starting up uh, to sit up and listen to it. Um, and I think one of the things I would argue, one of the things I would challenge is, how are you doing that here in this location? Because interestingly, that, that piece of work has been done in Brighton. There's a similar piece of work being kicked off just now in Bristol and Bath. And there's a similar piece of work being kicked off um, in the new year in the northeast, um, in the Northumbria and um, uh, Northumbria and uh, Newcastle sort of area. Um, so what's happening? Um, what's happening here in Coventry, and um, what can we do? What can anyone do to help um, foster that sort of interdisciplinary approach? So I think the role of design design practitioners will be an increasingly important one as design skills become more ubiquitous, the practice of design will at the same time become more specialised, uh, giving rise, I think, to the most fantastic and fascinating of new design careers. But maybe I'll just leave this one with you, and I'll, I'll finish now. In a sense, design, as, as Tim Brown, who um, runs a, a really um, well-respected and um, uh, international organisation called IDO, said, uh, maybe design is too important to put into the hands of just designers, um, and everyone needs to participate in the design process. Thanks very much. Well, that was great. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, um, John is open to uh, hear your questions, and uh, we'll provide you with some answers, I have no doubt. Um, so if there are any questions about what John's been talking about from the floor, then please raise your hand and we'll, uh, we'll have a listen. Do you find that it's the companies or organisations that get in contact with you directly that are more forward-thinking, or do you find that you have to go out and find those companies? Well, that's a, really, that's a really good question, because in a sense, um, our, our mission in life is not necessarily to talk to the converted. Um, our mission in life is to convert the unconverted. So it's more important that we reach the people and the businesses who don't understand that design can maybe play an important part in their, in their business strategy or the way they develop or the way they think about new ideas or new products. So um, in a sense, um, I mean, we'll, we always, we'll always talk to people who come and talk to us, obviously, but the more important thing for us is to reach the people who haven't yet seen the benefits of design. And for example, um, you know, I think there's a, uh, if, if you just think about what's going on in, in every town centre and every, na every government department, um, and the challenges that we're, all of those organisations are going to face over the next few years, <coughs> money is going to, money, you know, we're only halfway through the austerity that, uh, that, that is coming our way, and we're going to have to do things differently. And most, you know, local councils, most government departments have got rid of as many people as they can get rid of. They can't get rid of more people. They need to do things differently, and they need to think imaginatively about what they're going to bring to the party to get them to think about doing that. So it's reaching those sorts of people um, and getting them to think differently that's the, the real challenge. But you were going to ask something else. Yeah, I was just going to follow that. What you mentioned, sorry, thank you. You mentioned about Coventry City Council and having a conversation with them and you've not heard back. Uh, well, we have Obviously, heard back. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, 
I'm Coventry born and bred. Um, I'm very passionate about this city and I can see that there's an immense uh, amount of potential in this city. Yeah. Um, and I know I don't speak for myself or just for myself, but it would be great to be in a position where you could force someone's hand to listen to experts <laughs> and, you know, and take it forward. Well, I think the, um, what, uh, what we're talking to Coventry about, I mean, I'm, there's no secret here, um, we're, we've got a really interesting experiment which is happening in Oxford at the moment, where we're working with Oxford Council and we're helping them use design as the stimulus to help get um, infrastructure projects, new housing, new transport links, new retail, up and running much, much faster than if each of these projects was approached single-mindedly. So, um, I mean, I'm sure many of you will have experienced this, that the planning system in the UK is an anachronism. It's um, out of date. It's, uh, it needs to be rethought. It's too political. It it's, doesn't have enough um, experienced people. Um, and I could go on and on. And by working with real experts, we can take a holistic view about the way that you look at a city. And I think that that holistic view of looking at a city can actually help drive the generation, the, the, the investment that um, more, many, many cities actually need to, to, take them to, the next, to take them to the next level. So I'll keep you posted. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Another question there. Trying to follow your theme a little bit, you'd asked what was happening in Coventry and no one seemed to want to say anything. I'd like to point out that there's a Twitter account for, for this um, event and I'm not involved in the event, I'm just here. <laughs> no one's tweeting. We're all here to network, we're all here to get in touch with other yeah. people and, like, and businesses um, around. If we start tweeting, we can get in touch with each other independently and we can all start talking and maybe our businesses can work together and maybe that'll help the city as well it's it's i'm not from here originally i think it's um a, an interesting city <laughs> um from an outsider's point of view anyway um and I, I think we could all do something to make it work a little bit better so even if you just tweet something you might connect with another business that can help yours I often wish I was 30 years younger for lots of reasons, <laughs> but, but one of the reasons is it's just that it's really fascinating. I mean, we have a new way of working that is emerging, um, and a very exciting new way of working, and uh, I think it just opens up so many possibilities um, for the future. I mean, just to, just to add to that, about you were talking about the uh, sort of alluding to uh, the stimulation and design acting as a catalyst for accelerating innovation and getting things done. Um, just by, when I was at PDD, we'd, we would do um, creative innovation sessions where we would invite people from lots of different companies just to spend two days doing a workshop just to introduce them to uh, human-centered design techniques and th design thinking. And it was incredible what happened, what turned what turned around in, the, in terms of their thinking, but also in, in, in terms of how they would then go back and evangelise about the process within their companies, and then we'd get more calls, and the word just kind of spreads. It once you get it going, it's uh, it's difficult to put the fire out, you know. It's um, but I think it's uh, and a lot of a lot of design is about um, moving obstacles out of the way or reframing problems and realising that the obstacle is not a real thing. It's an assumption somebody's made or it's some anachronistic um, <coughs> way we've always done things. And as soon as we can start to, to do that and smooth the path, or not even change, change, change tack completely, that, that's not where we want to be going, actually, it's over here. Mm. But it's that, that using design to facilitate the consultation and the stimulation of ideas that, that creates acceleration and ultimately innovation. Um, yeah. We were sort of talking before, um, before the session kicked off about there was a time when... Um, there was this phrase called designers as gods. I mean, and, you know, there were, there were designers in the past who, you know, announced and pronounced and that was the way it was and nothing else would, um, nothing else would change. Well, fortunately, we've moved on from there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think uh, design uh, needs to be very humble in what it can achieve, but it also should be very confident that it's a, an amazing discipline and an amazing skill that can... Um, cajole, that can co uh, encourage collaboration, that can um, synthesize, that can um, aggravate, that can um, 
uh, encourage. And uh, the way that designers work, um, the really well-trained designers, because not you know, not universal, but the really well-trained designers can actually make a real difference. Um, so if you know a designer, bring them into your company and uh, get them to um, have a think about how you might do things differently. Okay, another question. Oh, oh maybe, maybe, maybe that lady over there will come back to you afterwards. Just on a practical level, yeah. how do you find the connect people that want something with people that can provide it as in if some a, a company come to you and they need to meet a designer okay how, how do you practically do Fine, that um, and well, there used to be the design book in the 80s didn't there i can't remember what it was called there's the a, well, industrial design there's what uh, we um we provide a thing called uh design support so it's a it's a government backed uh, initiative so uh, it's like a business growth support mechanism where we will, uh, if you get in touch with us, um, we'll evaluate whether you're the right, w whether we think that we can help you. And if we can, then the, the, the system kicks into play very quickly. And that then means that we put, we put you in touch with one of our associates or the people who are spread throughout the country. And you get very quick access and very personal access to um, the real sort of thinking that will allow you to, to move forward. And then, um, you know, we, we do different levels of intervention. We do uh, rapid, quick fire interventions, or we do much more intense interventions which last, you know, weeks and often months. I mean, people like um, uh, Nailers, we worked with for over two years to help them get to where they, they, they got. So it, it depends, different um, horses, different horses, different courses. Um, but if you go on our website, you should be able to get to um, the design support <laughs> team and then get in touch with them and away we go. Design support. Okay. Design so support. This is from a designer's point of view. This is what I mean. Is it's not if a company comes to you. If a company comes to you and they need a designer, yep. where do you, do you link them up? Oh, with I see. A designer. So. Um, Again, what I would do is uh, you need to make yourself, and if you're a designer, you need to make yourself known to that same design support team. Because what we, what we do as a design council is um, our, our challenge for the design industry is to grow the pie, is to expose more organizations to the opportunities that design has. And we are essentially are a, a facilitator. So we will introduce design companies to uh, small businesses, small medium-sized businesses, the, 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 the sort of design companies that we think are most appropriate for the challenges that these companies face. Um, but unless we know about you, we can't introduce you. What's interesting me, because I, I hadn't heard of this since the early 80s when yeah. they, I think there used to be some kind of book that we were all in. And yeah. We don't have that anymore, no. I mean, because everything's online these days, but, um, and we don't do a, um, a, a directory service, but what we do do is um, we're very aware of the design companies who are around, um, and that, that works that way. I mean, uh, it, that sort of service, there is an organization called the Design Business Association mm -hmm. who runs something very similar to that, actually. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you very much for your participation. It's, uh, it's always uh, a bit worrying after a, 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 a speech such as this, but I think it's um, praise to John that he stimulated so many interesting questions. So uh, thanks to you. Thanks very much again. And uh, thanks to you, the audience. <laughs>